Let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the University of Ottawa Department of Emergency Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, it's my uh, my name is Jim. I'm one of the uh, PGY fives uh, here in the Royal College Training Program. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the inaugural Grand Rounds of the 2020-2021 academic year. Uh, like last year, I'll be taking the next hour to talk to you about some landmark papers published uh, that reflect that are relevant to our practice in emergency medicine. Um, I will present to you four cases. Um, you can put your questions in the chat. Dr. Omar Anjum will help uh, moderate the chat, but we'll save all the questions till the very end. Before I start, I have a long list of people without whose time, support, and wisdom this talk just would not be possible. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank my uh, mentor and my supervisor for this talk, uh, Dr. Nick Costain. I would not be here uh, where I am right now without his support and kindness. So I count myself truly fortunate and blessed to have him as a role model and mentor. A huge thank you as well to Caitlin Andrus. She's a fourth year medical student interested in emergency medicine. She worked really, really hard on the background research for our first case, and you'll be hearing from her during this talk. You can also look forward to a great blog post from her uh, regarding PE diagnosis. Um, big thank you to Dr. Garrick Mock and Dr. Richard Hong for reviewing my slides. Uh, Dr. Renee Bradley for sharing some of her slides from her grand rounds earlier this year. Uh, to our content experts, uh, Dr. Gregoire Legal uh, from Thrombosis, Dr. Jason Reinglass uh, from GI, and you guys know Dr. Peter Reardon, uh, who uh, trained here and is an intensivist, uh, as well as an emergency physician. Um, big thank you to my study group, uh, Dr. Nick Shuela, Dr. Michael Wong, and my partner, Dr. Mary Jang, who's writing a Royal College as we speak. And again, big, 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 big thank you to the 80 uh, staff and residents who filled out my survey. Uh, just a quick disclaimer. Uh, there's been a ton published about COVID in the last nine months, and while I'm sure some of you would like a summary of the most up-to-date literature thus far, I just could not bring myself to do another Grand Rounds on COVID. COVID has been consuming so much of our lives in the past I wasn't month, sure. Be and it has essentially taken over 2020. We need a break. So sorry to disappoint those who wanted a COVID update, but I will not be covering any COVID-related uh, papers today. In fact, I plan to distance myself both socially and physically from any COVID related topics. And I promise to stay at least two meters away from anything COVID related for the remainder of this talk. I'm hoping to remind everyone that impactful non COVID publications still exist, and it remains important for us to stay up to date with medicine outside of COVID care. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to, uh, to Caitlin Andrus, a fourth year medical student interested in emergency medicine. She's going to be taking you through our first case. So hi everyone, as Jim said, my name is Caitlin and I'm a fourth year medical student here at Ottawa that's been working alongside Jim these past few months to help summarize some of the most recent literature and PE workup and diagnosis. So we have four cases to take you through today and I'll be walking you all through case one, which we've called the Dimer Dilemma. So this case was sent out beforehand. So you have a 52 year old female who presents to the eMERGE with pleuritic chest pain and shortness of breath and you're concerned that she might have a PE. So her well score is three, uh, so she's low risk and you send a D-dimer. But before that value returns, you ask yourself what D-dimer cutoff you would use in this patient to reliably rule out a PE. So we polled the group and it looks like 10% of you are using 500 as your threshold, 71% of you are using the age adjusted threshold, and then only 8% of the group is using 1000 as their D-dimer cutoff for this low risk patient. So pulmonary embolism is an important entity to be familiar with because it's both common, affecting 25 to 100 people per 100,000 a year, which is about 30,000 Canadians, and it's potentially fatal. So it actually ranks as the third most deadly cardiovascular disease after heart attack and after stroke. And then importantly, even for patients who do survive after PE, they're at risk of long-term physiologic consequences such as pulmonary hypertension. So the two main diagnostic tests that we're all very familiar with for PE are the D-dimer assay and CT angiography or CTPA. So on one hand, a D-dimer result returns faster, it doesn't expose the patient to radiation, and it's also highly sensitive for PE. But the issue with D-dimer is that it's not very specific and, and many entities such as age or a concomitant malignancy can also cause elevations in D-dimer rates. So this leads to a high false positive rate. On the other hand, CTPA is highly sensitive and specific, and it can also help to identify alternative diagnoses in your patients. But it's more time and cost intensive, and it also can cause contrast-induced nephrotoxicity and exposes patients to radiation. So in terms of the radiation exposure from a single CTPA scan, it amounts to about three times the annual background radiation that the average Canadian might experience in a single year. And this impact is most significant in women, especially in younger women, because the breast tissue is so highly sensitive to the carcinogenic effects of radiation. 
So when we compare CTPA to other commonly ordered imaging tests in the ED, we can see that it takes many fewer CTPAs to cause a single radiation induced cancer, especially again in that female population. So considering that the average emergency physician will likely order more than 10 CTPAs per year, this can easily amount to over 300 CTPAs in one's career. And as we know, VQ scanning to diagnose PE offers the advantage of reduced radiation, but it also has cons as well. Uh, it's not readily available, especially after hours or at community hospitals. So therefore the challenge remains, how can we reduce this unnecessary imaging for patients without missing that critical PE diagnosis? So we need a way to use the D-dimer to help risk stratify patients into those who need further imaging and those in whom further imaging isn't needed to rule out their PE. So over the past few decades, there have been many developments in how a D-dimer should be used in the workup of patients presenting with possible PE. So Dr. Wells first validated the Wells score back in 2001. And as we're quite familiar with, a score of less than or equal to four by Wells deems you as low risk and therefore necessitates that you order a D-dimer. If that D-dimer is less than the threshold value of 500, then no further imaging is required. However, if the D-dimer returns is greater than 500 or if the Wells score is greater than four, then imaging with CTPA is recommended. So Dr. Klein then validated the PERC rule in 2008, and his study found that as long as one's pretest probability for having a PE is low, which their group defined as less than 15%, and the patient demonstrated none of the high-risk features included within his PERC, uh, PERC rule, then no further workup was required, so not even a D-dimer in order to rule out PE in these patients. So observational studies have shown that D-dimer levels rise naturally with age, even in an otherwise healthy patient population. And unfortunately, this means that very few elderly patients can actually have their PE ruled out without ruled out with a D-dimer cutoff of 500. So therefore, in 2014, Dr. Regini and his team sought to develop and determine the, determine the efficacy of an age-adjusted cutoff for D-dimer. So in his adjust PE study, age times 10 was validated as the D-dimer cutoff for patients 50 years or older. And this actually led to a 12% decrease in CTPA rates compared to the original Wells score, and only a 0.3% miss rate for PE diagnoses. Unfortunately, the benefit in preventing unnecessary imaging gained by this age-adjusted approach is almost entirely in the elderly population. However, we know that the risks of radiation exposure are much more relevant to young people, especially again, those young females. So in 2017, a group from the Netherlands attempted to develop an algorithm to reduce imaging that was actually beneficial to all age groups. So their year's algorithm simplified the Wells score into three features that they found to be most predictive of a PE. So clinical signs of DVT, hemoptysis, and PE is the most likely diagnosis. And the year's algorithm suggested that if your patient has zero of these year's items, then it's safe to actually increase your D-dimer threshold to 1,000. However, if your patient had one or more year's items, then the traditional 500 D-dimer threshold was recommended. So the year study led to a further led to a decrease of 14% compared to the Wells study and only had a 0.6% miss rate. So most recently, in 2019, Dr. Kieran and his team conducted the PEG study, and that was done here in Canada. So in the last two decades, we've really seen efforts to raise the bar when it comes to the use of D-dimer in PE diagnosis. And this PEG study is really the most recent step in this relentless drive to refine our diagnostic strategies, to avoid over-imaging patients and all the subsequent radiation risks that come with that, yet prevent these fatal misses. So in the opinion of many emergency physicians and thrombosis experts, this study is really the cherry on top of over 20 years of progress that's helped improve PE care around the world. So in terms of PEGD and the study design, PEGD was a prospective multi-center cohort study from again, Canadian academic centers. It involved 2017 patients who presented either to the eMERGE or to outpatient clinics with signs and symptoms suggesting that they had a PE. So the authors compared the, well, the PEGD algorithm, which adjusted D-dimer to the patient's clinical probability and compared that to the standard Wells score. So to walk you through the PEGD algorithm, the authors defined low pretest probability as a Wells score of less than or equal to four, and they evaluated the use of 1,000 as a D-dimer threshold in this patient population. And then Dr. Kieran and his team defined moderate pretest probability as a Wells score of 4.5 to 6, and suggested that 500 was used as the D-dimer threshold in this patient population. And lastly, for patients with a high pretest probability or a Wells score of greater than or equal to 6.5, the recommendation was that these patients receive immediate CTPA. So the PEG study did have some notable exclusion criteria. So children, pregnant, anticoagulated patients, or patients who had undergone a major surgery in the past three weeks weren't included in the study. 
And then the primary outcome was to assess for the number of patients with symptomatic VTEs within the 90-day follow-up period. And secondarily, they also aim to compare the efficacy of the PEGD algorithm to both the age-adjusted and the years algorithms. So in terms of results from the PEG study, so 1,285 patients were deemed as low risk by PEGD and then went on to further have a negative D-dimer. 40 patients were deemed as moderate risk and went on to have a negative D-dimer. And in summary, there were zero VTEs noted in a 90-day follow-up period. And there was also a 17.6% decrease in CTPA rates compared to Wells. So again, not a single missed VTE in patients who were deemed negative for PE by that PEGD algorithm. So this study also looked at uh, the group of patients enrolled in the PEG study and tried to assess what percentage of these patients would have on, would undergo CTPA imaging if the following algorithms were applied. So we can see here that the highest proportion of patient imaging occurs when the Wells algorithm is applied, so 51.9% of patients, then followed by age-adjusted, where 42.9% of these patients would undergo CTPA imaging. Years, 36.3% um, of patients would undergo imaging. And then the lowest... <laughs> Hey, can we ask someone to mute their mic? Thanks. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and then the lowest percent of patients that underwent imaging was here in the PEG study, so only 34.3% of patients. So clearly demonstrating an improvement in PE diagnosis and work in workup with less adverse effects to patients over time. So the bottom line is that a D-dimer cutoff of 1,000 is well-validated and safe for low-risk patients. And again, those are defined as patients with a well score of less than or equal to 4. So why use the D-dimer cutoff of 1,000? So beyond reducing unnecessary imaging for patients, a study published by our very own Dr. Bank and Dr. Reardon here in Ottawa showed us that using a cutoff of 1,000 can actually benefit our emergency departments as well. So their study looked at 972 patients over 26 months, and they found that a D-dimer threshold of 1,000 actually saved 310 hours in ED length of stay, uh, and then $167,000 in healthcare spending as well. So moderate risk patients were studied in both the PEGD and the YEARS study, but there are a few caveats we have to discuss here. So there were only 40 patients with moderate risk and a negative D-dimer in the PEG study. And while 0% of these patients had a VTE at follow-up, it's important to consider that the confidence intervals were quite broad with this data. In the YEARS study, 331 patients had one or more YEARS items and a, and a D-dimer of below 500. And a portion of these patients with one or more years items probably actually fell into the moderate Wells group. However, if they only presented with one years items, one years item, sorry, then they probably would have actually been deemed low risk by PEGD. So the issue is that we don't exactly know how many of these patients would have truly fallen into the moderate risk group as per PEGD, but certainly less than that 331 number. So with less than 331 moderate risk patients in years and only 40 in PEGD, we just didn't find there to be conclusive evidence to suggest a change in management for moderate risk PE patients. It's not yet validated by the literature to use a D-dimer threshold of 500 in these moderate risk patients, and instead we suggest that these patients continue going straight to CTPA. So as you can see, there's lots of evidence for adjusting the D-dimer threshold to either age or clinical probability. And we spoke to Dr. Gregoire Legal, who's a thrombosis expert and a leading researcher in this field, to gather his thoughts and some of the perspectives from his thrombosis colleagues on the evolving role of D-dimer in the assessment of PE. And his opinion is that we should be adjusting our D-dimer threshold. And at the minimum, he suggested using the age-adjusted D-dimer. Um, but he also stated that there's robust evidence to use 1,000 as the new D-dimer cutoff in low-risk patients. So to break it down even further, in these patients with zero years items, the maximum Wells score that you could get in a patient meeting every other non-years criteria is 5.5. And based on the prevalence of these characteristics, it'd be very rare for patients to present with all of these features that you see here in white, and yet not have PE as the most likely diagnosis. So meaning that this person's Wells score is probably high enough that they're going to be going directly to CTPA. And further, if you're missing even one of these non-years items, your well score would automatically drop down to four or at most 4.5, which brings you much closer to that low risk category. So as a reminder, both the years and the PEG study evaluated a D-dimer cutoff of 1,000 for low risk patients. 
And of the 1,743 patients in the year study, the vast majority, again, likely had a well score of less than or equal to four, and the miss rate was only 0.6%. On top of that, there were 1,752 patients in the PEG studies and only two missed VTEs. And interestingly, both of these patients actually originally underwent CTPA imaging, and it didn't, there wasn't a PE initially diagnosed on their imaging. So in total, we have over 3,500 patients worth of data to suggest that this practice is safe. And we think that you'll see from papers that Jim will present later on that practice has changed based on far less robust data. So if you're still not completely convinced by the argument, there's now new international guidelines that support the practice of adjusting our D-dimer thresholds. So in 2019, the European Society of Cardiology and the European Respiratory Society advocated that D-dimer should be adjusted to age or to clinical probability. So we hope that we've convinced you that a D-dimer threshold of 1,000 is safe in low-risk patients. However, in speaking with Dr. Legal, he did want to highlight some specific patient populations in which a D-dimer should not be used. So for patients who are already on anticoagulation, there's just no acceptable um, negative D-dimer result. And therefore, we can't be fully reassured when that D-dimer comes back as low. And then similarly, for patients who've had prolonged symptoms, we know that D-dimer, like a troponin level, tends to rise and then fall with time. And so for these two patient populations, they just weren't included in the studies we've previously talked about. And therefore, if you do have clinical suspicion for a PE in these patients, they should really go directly to imaging. So with all that in mind, and to summarize what we've discussed today, we'd like to propose the following algorithm. So in patients presenting with signs and symptoms of PE, the first step is to determine their well score. And we feel that really where the practice change here is mainly in this left hand side of the screen. So that low risk category, uh, low risk patients should have a D-dimer ordered and a threshold of a thousand or at minimum the age adjusted threshold should be used to rule out their PE based on the data that we've gone through today. For patients with a D-dimer of greater than 1,000 or whose well score is high risk for PE, then these patients should go directly to chest imaging. And then there's the question of pregnant patients. So based on Dr. Renee Bradley's talk at Grand Rounds in February, she recommended the use of the pregnancy adapted years algorithm. So we mostly agree with this approach as well, but we do recommend caution in using the D-dimer to rule out PE in pregnant patients with one or more years items or well scores of greater than four. So only 242 patients were included in this arm of the study, and only 31 patients actually had uh, one or more years items and a D-dimer of less than 500. So therefore, for most emergency physicians, they may be uncomfortable managing pregnant patients this way, and they would probably instead elect to have a discussion with thrombosis about the best management plan. So we discussed this with Dr. Legal as well, and he agrees that the use of D-dimer to rule out PE in moderate or higher risk pregnant patients is just not yet ready for prime time due to low, low numbers in this study as well as the other studies that have looked at this. So now back to our case, we have a 52 year old female again with pleuritic chest pain and dyspnea who you were concerned is presenting, who you were concerned is presenting with a possible PE. So her well score is three, so she's low risk. And we hope that we've been successful in convincing more than 8% 8, 8 of you that 1000 is actually a safe D-dimer cutoff for these low risk PE patients. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kaylin. You did a fantastic job. Um, so I'll be taking you guys through case two. Um, this is the case of is timing everything. Does the early bird catch the worm? And so again, I sent this case out ahead of time. It's a 60 uh, year old male with a history of gastric ulcers presenting with melina and lightheadedness. Initial uh, heart rate is 115. Systolic blood pressure is 90. First hemoglobin is 52 and you calculate his Blatchford score to be 13. After two units of uh, pack cells, his vital stabilized and there are no ongoing signs of bleeding. Uh, and my question for you was endoscopy should be performed within what time frame? And these were the answers I got. So some of you would call GI to scope overnight. Some would be OK with GI scoping the next day. But the vast majority of you um, uh, fit in this category where you'd be OK with GI scoping the next day, but would call them back if hemodynamically unstable. So I thought I'd start off with the guidelines. What do the guidelines say about uh, scoping upper GI bleeds? So in 2019, an international group of uh, gastroenterologists put together a guideline with regards to um, patients presenting with non variceal bleeding, and they recommended endoscopy within 24 hours. Um, another group, the American Society of uh, Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, recognized that variceal bleeding uh, presents a higher risk and thus recommended endoscopy sooner, within 12 hours. Even with these recommendations, some have theorized that there may be benefits to doing endoscopy even sooner than what the guidelines say. The benefits of early endoscopy are theorized to be early identification of source bleeding, early hemostatic treatment, reducing the risk of further bleeding, and reducing the need for I, uh, IR or surgical intervention. 
However, the early studies by Lin in 1996, Lee in 1999, and Bjorkman in 2004 showed no mortality benefit to early endoscopy. The big issue with these studies were that they did not target high-risk patients. In fact, they enrolled unselected patients and sometimes even excluded high-risk patients. Perhaps these patients would have done just fine regardless of when their endoscopy was. So the question became, what if we select patients who are at high risk and most likely to benefit? How do we exactly do that? I just want to remind everyone or introduce you to the Glasgow Blatchford score. Simon Wells touched upon this briefly during his grand rounds. Um, it essentially is a pre-endoscopic score, which means it doesn't require findings of endoscopy um, to look at risk in patients presenting with upper GI bleeding. It's found to perform other outperform other upper GI bleed scores, such as the AIM-65, the Rockall, and the PNID scores. Um, it's comprised of historical features, uh, vitals, as well as blood work. And just a quick note that this was predominantly created for peptic ulcer bleeding, so it probably doesn't fare as well for variceal bleeding. So how exactly do we use the Glasgow Blatchford score to risk stratify? Well, the literature shows that a score of greater than one suggests that a patient is at risk for needing intervention. A score of greater than six accurately predicts the need for intervention, and a score of greater than 12 has been associated with increased mortality. So two observational studies uh, have looked at the effects of the timing of endoscopy on high-risk upper GI bleed patients. One that favored early EGD and another that suggested against early EGD. Cho et al. published a paper uh, that showed decreased mortality if EGD was performed within six hours, uh, associated with fewer packed red cell transfusions and decreased need for intervention. However, another study by Larson showed the opposite effect. That mortality was lowest in patients who had a somewhat delayed EGD at between 6 and 24 hours. The big caveat here is that these are both observational cohort studies. They were, they were not RCTs. And so that really brings us to the paper I want to show you today. This is a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2020, uh, of, in April of this year, by uh, Lau et al., looking at the timing of endoscopy for acute upper GI bleeding. This is a single center RCT conducted in Hong Kong uh, that enrolled 516 patients. They enrolled patients in the ED as well as inpatients with overt signs of upper GI bleeding defined as hematemesis or melina. They only included high-risk patients that they defined as a, having a Glasgow Blaster score of greater than 12. Now, 12 is a pretty high score, so these patients were quite sick. They compared urgent endoscopy, which is endoscopy performed within six hours of GI consult, to early endoscopy. So endoscopy performed with... Uh, around six to 24 hours after GI consult, which usually meant the next morning or the next day. Um, of note, the patients who were assigned to this early endoscopy group were scoped earlier if they had signs of further bleeding, such as fresh hematemesis or hematochesia, or if they became hypotensive. And in this study, approximately 8% of those patients um, it, uh, enrolled to the early endoscopy group ended up having emergency endoscopy due to new onset bleeding. Um, other than this, all patients in the study received standardized care for upper GI bleed. They got a high dose PPI, and if they had a suspected variceal bleed, they were given vasoactive medications such as octreotide and IV antibiotics for SBP prophylaxis. Notable exclusions, they excluded anyone who was in hypotensive shock, uh, anyone who failed to stabilize after the initial resuscitation, and anyone who was moribund from terminal illness. The primary outcome was all-cause mortality within 30 days, and notable secondary outcomes include further bleeding, blood transfusions, need for emergency surgery or angiographic embolization, and then hospital and ICU length of stay. So what did they find? Well, they found no difference. No difference in mortality, no difference in further bleeding, no difference in the amount of transfusions, no difference in the rates of surgery embolization, and no difference in the hospital or ICU length of stay. I want to take a, a quick second to show you the absolute numbers. Again, this isn't really that important, the numbers themselves, and none of these numbers are actually significant. Um, but if you look at the column to the left, you see um, somewhat of a trend towards more death, more bleeding, more intervention in the urgent endoscopy group without any difference in the median length of stay or the number of uh, the amount of transfusions they uh, required. Obviously, this study had its limitations. This was a single center study. Um, and at the end of the day, urgent endoscopy group had more comorbidities. They had more ischemic heart disease, cancer, liver disease, and cirrhosis, which may uh, bias the results in favor of the early endoscopy group. Um, furthermore, this, may, this patient population may not be representative of our patients. This was a study conducted in Asia where they have much higher rates of peptic ulcer bleeding, whereas we probably see a bit higher percentage of variceal bleeding than what's on the screen there. So what's our bottom line? Well, the bottom line here is that urgent endoscopy may not benefit stable, high-risk upper GI bleeds, 
um, with no signs of ongoing bleeding. So the patients that kind of respond to your initial resuscitation. But there are a, bit, a few caveats. The first being that upper GI, uh, patients with upper GI bleeding, even stable ones, can decompensate quite quickly. Mortality in upper GI bleeds has been quoted to be as high as 10%. It was about 8% in this study. And again, recall that 8% of patients uh, randomized to the uh, early endoscopy group ended up needing emergency endoscopy due to new onset signs of bleeding. Um, so hemodynamic instability, if you're going to wait, hemodynamic instability or ongoing bleeding should trigger an urgent GI consult for endoscopy overnight. I do want to um, uh, advise caution in applying these results to variceal bleeds. This study, as well as most studies showing no benefit to urgent endoscopy, either predominantly included um, or exclusively included patients with peptic ulcer bleeding and non-variceal bleeding. Certainly, patients with variceal bleeding, especially those with high Blatchford scores, um, are at much higher risk and should still have early endoscopy. And I just want to remind you that the current GI guidelines still recommend EGD within 12 hours for these patients. I had a chance to talk to J Dr. Jason Reinglass, who's a gastroenterologist in uh, Toronto. Some of you re may remember him because he was a GI fellow here a couple of years back. I asked him for his opinion and the GI perspective on this paper. And ultimately, he said that this paper supports current practice. Uh, he stated that high-risk non-variceal bleeds, which he defined as a Glasgow Blatchard score greater than six, who are hemodynamically stable, can be scoped within 24 hours of the next day. But he did suggest that we speak to GI for urgent scope if the patient had signs of hemodynamic instability despite resuscitation, or if they had evidence of significant ongoing bleeding. Um, I asked him about the results of this paper, and he postulated some potential advantages for um, delayed endoscopy. He stated that urgent endoscopy is always more technically challenging, um, that there's always poor visibility early on, and waiting allows for the, our pharmacologic treatment to take effect for the patient to be resuscitated, and often that results in better results and improved visibility. This allows for less unnecessary intervention because the, the endoscopist can see better and more targeted intervention. He did want, to, he did agree that variceal bleeds are different. They are at much higher risk. And during his time in Ottawa, he stated that the local practice amongst the vast majority of gastroenterologists uh, at TOH was to scope persistent variceal bleeding overnight. However, he did say that some gastroenterologists would still wait on variceal bleeds that stabilize with, with resuscitation. He stated that now in the community, these patients are often held for him until the morning. But he did say that if he were to get called for a persistent variceal bleeding overnight, he would be more than happy to come in and scope that patient. He wanted me to end off by reminding everyone that the management of unstable upper GI bleeding is a multidisciplinary team approach. He definitely understands how busy we are and the challenges we face in managing a busy ED, and he wanted to recognize the great care you've all provided upper GI bleed patients during his time in Ottawa. Um, what he wanted me to remind everyone is that it's important not to simply call GI and forget about uh, the patient. Just like you resuscitate before you intubate, uh, patients with high-risk upper GI bleed uh, need to be adequately resuscitated prior to endoscopy. Re resuscitation helps optimize the patient for endoscopy and gives the endoscopist the best chance for success. It's always really hard for them to scope a, um, a hemodynamically unstable patient um, who's still like uh, bleeding without um, resuscitation. So that brings us to the end of our case. Um, again, just a reminder that this was a high-risk upper GI bleed um, that was initially a bit unstable but stabilized with treatment. And I agree with the 57% of you. That would probably be my practice um, in light of this paper is that I'd probably be okay um, calling GI overnight to let them know, but be okay with them scoping in the morning and calling medicine to admit these patients. All right, we're going to take a brief break from the hard-hitting academic papers and focus on something less cerebral but just as important. Now, I know it's super hard to sit and maintain attention for an hour, so this is my way of giving you a mental break. I promise lots of dog photos in the coming slides, but if you need to go to the bathroom or get yourself a quick drink, this is the time. Just don't take too long as you'll miss some really important info. We're going to move on to case three, the case of coloring or canines. What's the perfect way to de-stress? So we all know emergency medicine is a really stressful job. It takes a lot out of us, and there are definitely days where I go home and it feels like the whole day was a daze, especially when the, on days where the department looks like this, and we feel that we're just constantly trying to put out fires. Even the strongest and most well-adjusted individuals among us have bad days, and a string of bad days, challenging interactions, and perceived lack of gratitude for what we do can lead to burnout. And burnout itself can manifest in really awful ways. 
whether it's compassion fatigue, relationship difficulties, or even substance use, to name a few. And it's long been believed that due to the nature of our work, healthcare professionals working in emergency medicine are at particular risk. Um, burnout at some point or another is extremely prevalent in our profession. It's been quoted that up to 70% of our physicians and nurses working in emergency medicine have reported high levels of burnout at some point in their careers. And burnout is a direct threat to our career longevity and patient care. So whether it's meditation, exercise, the outdoors, or video games, we need something to keep us well. But what about if when we're at work, is there something that we can do to keep us happy like these folks? Well, as life coach and renowned motivational speaker Stephen Bernard Choi says, you need to take care of the machine in order to function at peak performance. And for Steve, wellness comes in the form of mandated breaks while on shift and protein bars. But for the rest of us mere mortals, is there something we can do at work to keep us well? Jeff Klein and his group uh, published a paper exploring interventions on shift that could reduce stress and improve uh, wellness. So in his study, uh, it was a single center RCT in the US that enrolled 122 participants who are emergency physicians, uh, residents, and ED nurses. Their study um, randomized patients to uh, time with a therapy dog, coloring, or no intervention, which is with their control. In their study, participants left their shift at the midway mark, and we were brought to a, a room physically separate from care areas, where there were no electronics, no telephones, and no overhead speakers. And they stayed in the room for five minutes doing uh, various things depending on what they were randomized to. So coloring if they were in the coloring group and playing with a dog if they're in the dog therapy group. So we're going to take a quick uh, aside to break down these two interventions, coloring versus dogs. Each has their pros and cons. Coloring is quiet. It's really easy to disinfect. And you get to take a home something to hang on the fridge. But ultimately, crayons lack physical warmth and they're kind of inert objects, whereas puppies, they're affectionate, cuddly, and warm, but they do pose an allergy risk to some, and there's always potential for bite. So I actually asked the group, um, adult coloring books or dogs, which one is more stressful than leaving? And it's clear that we have a lot of dog lovers within our department, but I take issue to the 11% of you Grinches who hate both dogs and coloring. Hate's a really strong word. All right, back to the study. Um, so the uh, the participants had their levels of stress measured at the beginning of their shift, um, 30 to 40 minutes after the intervention and near the end of their shift. Um, participants in the dog therapy group were free to pet the dogs as they wished, but participants in the coloring group were presented with three mandalas to choose from for, for which they could color. And yes, number one was the most popular option, although honestly, I'm not sure that those of you with kids should take this home and hang it on your fridge. Um, notable exclusions, uh, they excluded anyone who disliked dogs, who had a fear of dogs or an allergy, which is a bit unfair since the dislike or fear of crayons was not an exclusion criteria. So this potentially biases things against the dog therapy group because crayon haters could still be included while dog haters could not. What were their outcomes? Well, they measured stress um, on three different stress scales that looked something like this. And they also measured uh, salivary cortisol levels. At the end of the day, they found no difference. Across all measures, there was no reliable improvement in self-reported stress. Um, and the only interesting or significant finding was that salivary cortisol did decrease significantly in the, sig significantly in the coloring group and the dog therapy group. But if self-reported measures of stress didn't change significantly, it's hard to know what the relevance of, relevance of this decline is. Certainly this study had its limitations. It's a single center study the room that people were taken to had no windows, which is kind of depressing. And then what if you don't like dogs? What if you just want cat therapy? And five minutes also isn't a very long time. And some would say that long-term outcomes are arguably more important than just decreased stress at the end of shift. I mean, we all are slightly more stressed when we find out that we can go home. Um, so even though this study didn't find an, an improvement with their chosen interventions, wellness nonetheless is critical for job satisfaction and career longevities. So it doesn't have to be therapy dogs or coloring, but make sure you take breaks on shift and take time to recharge, especially after those tough cases. Um, I had to get some expert commentary on this. So I asked Nick's daughters, um, Nick Costain's daughters, because they have a dog and they color. Uh, they're just excited that a meaningful study has been published on this topic. Um, but just like the results from the Klein study, one was not clearly superior to the other and it ended up being a split decision. So I'm gonna end this section with some advice. 
Um, so when you have a rough day and you come home and you feel like this, just pour yourself a drink and forget about it. And just so you know, I'm trying to convince Guy to let us get a DM dog. So hopefully the next poll I send you is for dog names. All right, so moving on to our last case. Not too hot, not too cold. What temperature is just right? Um, I sent this case again out ahead of time. A 45-year-old male uh, with ROSC after an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. VF is his initial rhythm. 40 minutes of downtime, comatose post-ROSC, and then febrile shortly after to see Coulomb. What temperature do you target? These were the results. Uh, so a portion of people targeting 36, some targeting colder, some targeting slightly warmer. So what's the theory behind cooling? Well, we know anoxic brain injury leads to mortality and morbidity. Fever is really bad. It, ex it exacerbates this anoxic brain injury and it worsens brain uh, ischemia. So it's long been thought that hypothermia might reduce uh, free radical generation, reduce cerebral O2 consumption, and reduce ischemic injury. Two landmark trials published in 2002 suggested benefit to hypothermia. The first being the HACA trial um, in, from Europe and then the second being the Bernard trial from Australia. Now, these were two small RCTs, HACA enrolling 275 patients and Bernard enrolling just 77 patients. They compared hypothermia at a temperature of somewhere between 32 to 34 to normal thermia. And they included patients with shockable rhythms only. So there were no patients with PEA or asystole included. What they found was a remarkable benefit for hypothermia in terms of survival with favorable neurologic outcome. The HACA trial showed a 16% benefit in neurointact survival, and the Bernard trial showed an even more remarkable 23% benefit. So in light of these two studies, there was a ton of hype around hypothermia, and many organizations put out guidelines recommending hypothermia after cardiac arrest. However, things changed a little bit in 2013 when Nielsen et al. published the targeted temperature management trial that provided us with a new perspective. Unlike the HACA and the um, Bernard trial, the TTM trial was a large RCT enrolling over 950 patients. Um, they compared cooling to 33 degrees Celsius to cooling to 36 degrees Celsius. So all patients got cooled, even their normal thermia group. Um, they included all patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest of presumed cardiac cause, regardless of rhythm. So they included PA and asystole patients. And what probably is even mo more important or the most important is they had a standardized protocol for withdrawal for care. Um, because a lot of patients who are comatose after cardiac arrest died uh, due to withdrawal of care, they standardized the protocol. And furthermore, the, the clinicians doing the neuroprognostication and the assessment of outcomes were blinded to what group the uh, patients had been randomized to. The Nielsen group found no difference in death at six months and no difference in neurologic function at six months. And these results held true even when they did subgroup analysis to look at the effect within the shockable and the non-shockable rhythm subgroups. Now, the Nielsen study is the largest, most methodologically sound and robust RCT to date with regards to hypothermia post-cardiac arrest. And in light of this, uh, many organizations such as the AHA, ERC, and CCS changed their recommendations to raise the um, uh, temperature target up to 36. However, some organizations are still holding out, most notably the Canadian Critical Care Society. So after 2013, further data regarding TTM remained quite scarce for many years until the publication of the Hyperion trial at the end of 2019. So this is a uh, study looking at targeted temperature management for cardiac arrest with non-shockable rhythms. Um, it was a multi-center RCT in 25 ICUs in France that enrolled 851 patients. They enrolled adults with ROSC after both in-hospital and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest with non-shockable rhythm due to any cause. Um, the patients have to be comatose or have a GCS of less than eight. They randomized their patients to hypothermia, so a targeted temperature of 33, versus normal thermia, which is a targeted temperature of 37. Uh, they excluded patients who had prolonged no flow time or greater than 10 minutes from collapse to the initiation of CPR, prolonged low flow time or greater than 60 minutes from initiation of CPR to ROSC, and patients who are uh, in refractory shock despite multiple vasopressors. Um, they looked at their primary outcome was survival with favorable neurologic outcome, and notable secondary outcomes include mortality, length of mechanical ventilation or ICU length of stay, and adverse events. So what did they find? Well, they found that hypothermia was associated with improved survival with favorable neurologic outcomes, um, with an absolute improvement of 4.5%. 
their p-value is 0.04 and they just managed to meet the predefined threshold for significance however looking at their secondary outcomes they found no difference in overall mortality no difference in the duration of mechanical ventilation no difference in icu length of stay and no difference in the rates of adverse events so as it stands now, we have three trials that show benefit to hypothermia, yet one big, well-conducted RCT that shows no difference. What do we, like, how do, what do we make of this data? I want to take a little bit of a deeper dive into the potential limitations of the positive trials. So the first thing I want to discuss is fragility. Now, many of you have heard about the fragility index. For those who haven't, it's the number of patients whose outcomes would have to be changed to turn a statistically significant result into a non-significant result. In the Bernard trial, the fragility index is zero, which essentially means that the choice of statistical test alone can turn a statistically significant result into a non-significant one. In the trial that I just presented, the our Hyperion trial, the fragility index was just one, which means if one patient in the um, hypothermia group was judged to have slightly less favorable neurologic outcome, the um, result of this study would have been non-significant. Now, there are arguments on the other side that the p like in the modern era, that perhaps a Bayesian analysis would probably be more important than an absolute p-value. But I'll leave that to the stats nerds. Uh, further limitations of the Hyperion trial, the hypothermia group had targeted temperature management for longer than the normal thermia group in this study. So they had it for 56 to 64 hours versus just 48 hours. And more importantly, a substantial portion of the patients in the normal thermia group became febrile. Um, that's really bad. Uh, this is a graph of the temperatures um, for uh, the patients in the Hyperion trial. The black uh, dots and the arrow bars are for the normal thermia group. And I drew a, a line out in red. That's the bar for fever. That's 38 degrees Celsius. So as you can see, even from the very beginning of the trial, um, the normal thermia group didn't truly achieve normal thermia. A good portion of them became febrile. So what about the other positive trials? This is the same graph for the HACA trial. Again, the normal thermia group in black. And you can see that the upper limit of those T-bars hit pretty close to uh, 38 or febrile. And if you look at the fine print in the graph, it says that the T-bars indicate the 75th percentile for the normal thermia group, which means 25% of patients fell above that those upper limits of the T-bars. So patients definitely got febrile in the HACA trial. And what about the Bernard trial? Um, well, that the numbers in those boxes are the upper limits um, of the temperature in the normal thermia group. And you can see that even though none of them cross 38 degrees, they come pretty darn close. They sit somewhere between 37.8 and 37.98. And again, looking at the fine print, it says here that the plus minus values are means plus minus one standard deviation. And so if you recall high school stats, assuming, assuming a normal distribution, 15% of the data falls above that, those numbers. So again, Patients became febrile in the Bernard study um, when they were randomized to normal thermia. So let's look at the only real study that, that showed no benefit, which was the TTM trial. Now, this is that same graph. It's quite clear here that the TTM trial was the only trial in which the normal thermic group actually stayed normal thermic. This is the only trial in which their normal thermic group didn't get a fever. And that's because all the patients in the study, including their 36 degrees group, got cooled. And, and for any doubters, the error bars in the chart represent two standard deviations. So we're, it encompasses most of the data. So what's our bottom line here? I think the only thing we can really conclude is that fever is really, really bad. I want to stress that the results of the TTM trial and the limitations of those positive studies does not suggest that cooling doesn't work. On the contrary, I think it suggests that cooling and prevention of fever is critical in the management of the comatose ROSC patient. So my bottom line is that all patients who are comatose following ROSC need to be cooled to prevent fever. Um, in light of the, uh, and just a real quick reminder that these are the current guidelines, in light of the Hyperion trial, there was no real compelling evidence to change any of these recommendations. It didn't really tell us anything that we didn't know, already know before. It just reinforced that fever is really awful. So ultimately, the actual temperature that you target probably isn't all that important, as long as it's somewhere between 32 to 36. So what's most important is that we start cooling in the emergency department, um, because unless you work in the periphery um, where there's long transfer times, your patients are likely to be whisked off to the ICU, the cath lab or the CCU before you ever achieve this target. And so you can leave um, the debate over the exact temperature target to the intensivists and the cardiologists. But again, 
it's super, super important that we start cooling and that we do not target a temperature of 37. We've seen now from three RCTs that there's just insufficient room for error and the patients do become febrile and have worse outcomes. So I spoke to Pete about this study. As you guys, uh, most of you know Pete, emergency physician who trained here and as well as an intensivist about his perspective on hypothermia following cardiac arrest. I'm gonna take the next few minutes to share a few of Pete's pearls. Um, so Pete feels strongly that um, everyone should be cooled. Um, this means um, a fully a fully catheter with a temperature probe in the bladder, as well as ice packs in the groin and the axilla. He asks nothing more but these two things. Um, so, and I agree with him. I think before transfer, we should put a bladder probe in and at the minimum put ice packs in the groin and the axilla. Um, and he, again, he wanted me to emphasize that in the TTM trial, all patients got cooled and the results should not be mistaken for the notion that cooling doesn't matter. Um, he also said that the initial rhythm probably doesn't matter. Whether you start in VF and degenerate into PA or in PA from the beginning, the brain doesn't really care what causes the low flow. And again, he wanted me to stress that fever is bad. So you've heard it from me. You've heard it from Pete. I don't know if I can say this enough times, but fever is so, 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 so bad. So please do not let your, parent, uh, your patients become febrile following ROSC. Um, there's potential benefit for cooling and really minimal downside. And I want to address that minimal downside um, with some mis myth busting. There's been a long held belief that lower temperatures or hypothermia leads to more adverse events. But honestly, the, the evidence doesn't support this. Um, the four RCTs on this topic, in all four RCTs, there was no difference between the rates of significant adverse events between the hypothermia group and the normal thermia group. And my take on it is that fever is so bad that I would rather you target a lower temperature and prevent fever than risk not meeting your targets and having the patient become febrile. Um, and Pete agrees with this. He said that instability post arrest is not due to cooling. It's most likely due to the underlying cause of the arrest and the physiology of the arrest. Um, the only real contraindications of cooling, and this comes from the Canadian um, guidelines, are severe infection, uncontrolled bleeding, and refractory shock. And even then, Pete suggested that uncontrolled bleeding for him isn't an absolute contraindication. Most of these times, these uncontrolled bleeding events are not due to coagulopathy from cooling, uh, but rather something else due to uh, that went on during the arrest and usually has to be dealt with um, surgically or by IR. So he still cools these patients. So um, bringing us back to that case of that 45-year-old um, uh, guy who comes in with 40 minutes of downtime and is comatose. Again, the absolute target temperature you target is an important, whether you're in the green group or that blue group, I think you're fine. But the most important thing is that we need to start cooling these patients. So put a Foley probe into the bladder um, to measure temperature and put ice packs on the groin and axilla. You also get paid like 300 bucks to do it. So if you needed other in, um, incentives. Now that brings us to the end of um, the papers that I'm gonna cover. Now there are a few couple of big landmark papers that you might've read that I didn't cover today. There are two big papers on TXA the HALTIT trial and the CRASH-3 trial that looked at the use of TXA in, in uh, GI bleeding and in head injury. Megan Fu is going to cover those in her uh, grand rounds in December. There are two stroke studies, direct MT and THALES. Direct MT looked at um, thrombectomy alone versus thrombectomy plus TPA, and THALES was another uh, paper on dual antiplatelet therapy, and those may be covered by Dr. Doran Drew in his grand rounds. Um, with regards to status epilepticus, the ESSET trial was published that looked at anti-epileptics and st status epilepticus. This was already covered by Dr. Evelyn Tran in her grand rounds earlier this year. And the last big paper was a paper on pneumothorax management, look, comparing conservative to interventional treatment. And uh, this has not been dibs yet, but going by the pattern of R4s covering papers that I don't cover, I suspect that it's open for grabs if one of the R4s wants to take it. All right. So I just want to summarize what we talked about today and, and leave you with a couple of, uh, remind you of a couple of take home points. So in case one, we looked at the dimer dilemma and our recommendation for you was that a D-dimer cutoff of 1000 should be used for low risk patients undergoing workup for PE. In our second case, the case of is timing everything, does the early bird really catch the worm? Um, our bottom line is that urgent endoscopy may not benefit stable high risk upper GI bleeds with no signs of ongoing bleeding. So that patient that comes in at high risk, you resuscitate and they stabilize. I can probably wait till the next morning. However, remember that this may not apply to variceal bleeds. Um, in our third case, uh, culling our canines, what's the perfect way to de-stress? 
Um, our bottom line was that wellness is critical for job satisfaction and career longevity. So make sure you take some breaks on shift and keep yourself well. And in our last case, not too hot, not too cold, what temperature is just right? Our bottom line is that fever is really, really bad and all these patients should be cooled to prevent fever. So please, please, please start the cooling process in the eMERGE, you get paid well for it. All you have to do is put a Foley probe in and ice packs in the groin and in the axilla. It'll be the easiest 300 bucks you've ever made. Um, the absolute target temperature that you target probably isn't that important as long as it's somewhere between 32 and 36. Um, and we know from three good RCTs now that you shouldn't target 37. There's just not sufficient room for error. The patients will become febriles and their brains will get fried. All right, that brings us to the end of uh, my talk. And so just like the last year, I'm going to end with a plug for Journal Club. All these papers either have been or will be covered in Journal Club at some point. Um, so please come to Journal Club and get smart. And that brings us to the very end of my talk. Uh, please follow me on Twitter. And that's a QR code. If you scan on your phone, you get a list of all my references for all my slides. And I'm happy to take any questions.